lawyer. He graduated for, from Harvard Law School, clerked for a judge, taught at the University of Miami Law School, and worked on civil rights cases for the New Hampshire affiliate of the ACLU before becoming a partner with Bacchus, Meyer, and Branch in 1981. He has won cases before both the New Hampshire and United States Supreme Courts. He's been chair of the New Hampshire Bar Association's Labor and Employment Law Section and devotes a large part of his practice to representing employees in employment cases. He also works in the areas of school law, civil rights, personal injury, and business litigation. And he's even been recognized, and I realize that in this room, this might not be considered a huge accomplishment, but he has been recognized in the book Best Lawyers in America in the fields of employment and First Amendment law. And what I find most amazing about John Meyer, when I first moved to New Hampshire in 2012, I picked up a copy of The Keen Sentinel, and one of the front page articles was Bigfoot wins free speech case at Mount Monadnock. The lawyer for that was John Meyer. How many people remember the Robin Hood of Keen case from a few years ago that went to the New Hampshire Supreme Court twice? The lawyer for that was John Meyer. Let's give a big round of applause for our keynote speaker, John Meyer. Thank you. I knew, um, looking at the agenda, knowing that I was the last speaker on the, a long day, uh, following an open bar, it was going to be a, a tough challenge. But now having known, having to follow Dan um, makes that challenge, you know, multiple, multiplies the, the difficulty of it. Even worse, I've been assigned a, um, a legal topic. Uh, it is the First Amendment, but nevertheless, it is it is law. I'm hoping that in this group that you will act as libertarians, you will not follow Robert's rules of order, you will not hesitate to interrupt me, uh, to ask questions, um, to heckle, or whatever else you may want to do to make this somewhat, hopefully, a more uh, interactive type, type presentation. Um, from my perspective, this is a great opportunity. Um, part of my practice, and the most fun part of my practice, is the First Amendment. And I think the history of this country is that First Amendment cases are not spawned by Democrats, or Republicans, or anybody else representing the mainstream groups. Almost inevitably, the plaintiffs in, in the most exciting and most important and most precedental cases are the malcontents, the lone voices, um, persons who come from different points of view, represent different types of issues, often people who are well before their time. Um, and so you, looking out on this group, I see um, basically a whole sea of potential plaintiffs ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought my, if I'd really been thinking this through, I would have brought my business card and distributed it um, by each table. Um, one thing that, most of you may not be aware of is, is how much the history of New Hampshire, or how much the history of the First Amendment is based on New Hampshire. Um, and, and how many of the cases going back um, almost until the sort of the beginning of the First Amendment cases, which is really only the 1920s, uh, have come from New Hampshire. Uh, and, and a large number of those cases came from the Jehovah's Witnesses who were particularly active in this state um, in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and they were very controversial, very fearless, uh, they didn't believe in military service, uh, very critical of other religions, uh, and, and very courageous. Uh, and, and one of the sort of my, my favorite plaintiffs, slightly before my time, is a gentleman named Walter Chaplinsky, who in the town of Rochester in the early 1940s uh, was preaching from corner to corner. Uh, he was attacked by a mob. Uh, he sought the protection of the uh, local police department. Uh, they ended up bringing him 
or to the police station, allegedly for his protection. Along the way, he um, cursed at one of the local public officials, and then he was arrested for disturbance of the peace. And that case ultimately went to the U.S. Supreme Court on whether or not he had the freedom of speech to call the local constable a goddamn fascist. He actually acknowledged the word, he acknowledged the word fascist, but I didn't use the term goddamn. Uh, in any event, he, he, that case was actually lost. And that case was the origin of this doctrine of fighting words, which is that if you say something, that would otherwise be considered free speech, but which is likely to elicit a violent response from the person to whom it's directed, that therefore it is no, not protected. Now, it's sort of ironic that one would look at the police department and say that their proclivity to respond violently becomes a grounds for abrogating the First Amendment. Um, happily, that case, although very well known in sort of the legal history, has not, by and large, been followed. Although it has now become sort of, in the public mind, I think, sort of mixed with this idea of hate speech, which is an entirely different, essentially, legal doctrine. And at least in theory, hate speech is protected, whereas, whereas fighting words are not. More recently, in the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, this goes now to the 1960s, a gentleman named George Maynard who I think at that point had been actually been kicked out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, he taked over the New Hampshire motto on the license plate, live free or die, uh, and ended up in jail for a significant period of time for that offense. That case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and in a very important precedent, the court said, basically, you cannot be compelled to display the message of the state. Uh, I think it's hard to imagine a First Amendment case that actually is, is to me, more libertarian than that one. It came out of the state of New Hampshire, and actually that is that remains um, good law, even though the person who was responsible for it was widely regarded, and perhaps correctly regarded, as being a, being a crank. Um, the other significant slice of First Amendment history from this state is cases of the 1950s, uh, when there was a crusade against anybody who was believed to be sympathetic with the communists. Uh, and there was a, um, the Attorney General at the time, Louis Weinman in New Hampshire, had his own sort of investigative task force. Uh, a number of people were imprisoned, um, kicked out of the University of New Hampshire, and so on and so forth, and that resulted, uh, and again, in some landmark uh, U.S. Supreme Court cases. So this is a state which, despite its small size, is really uniquely important within the development of the First Amendment. Um, but the, you know, as, as um, Daryl said, um, my more recent involvement was with the uh, Robin Hood Six. Um, and that was a, um, for me, certainly, again, an example of the First Amendment being fun. Um, and, and I want to just talk about it briefly, because that was, in, in, in many levels, it was an important victory for the First Amendment. Um, but it also has some really good, the court decisions had some really disturbing implications, which I don't think most people, are, um, certainly not even lawyers, have really given any thought to. Um, that case, again, I'm sure people are familiar with the basic facts of it. You had six um, very creative individuals who came up with a very you know, innovative form of political protest. I mean, it's hard to imagine how the issue of municipal parking in Keene, New Hampshire, repeatedly ends up on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> uh, except, except for the, the imaginative uh, form of protest that um, the uh, Robin Hooders uh, utilized. Um, ironically, the city of Keene came up with an almost equally um, imaginative political uh, legal strategy to try to contest them. Now, I think in the world of political protest, being imaginative is a good thing. In the world of law, being imaginative is generally not a good thing. <laughs> and that was certainly true in this case. The theory of the city of Keene was that the demonstrators, by upsetting the parking enforcement officers, were interfering with the contractual rights between the parking enforcement officers and the city of Keene. Now, putting aside the fact that these, con these enforcement officers basically had no contract rights to start with, 
the, the idea that using this sort of tort theory of interfering with someone's contractual rights as a means of suppressing, you know, First Amendment protest was was certainly unique, and it was it was. I mean, it was faulty on so many different grounds, it was hard to know where to start. And I think the trial judge was aware of that even before my involvement. Went through three days of, of um, trial, which I think, again, was probably as important on a public relations ground as on a legal ground. And the case eventually went to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Um, after this, the trial judge basically determined that you could not um, basically apply tort theory which is like personal injury theory, to a political demonstration without, because the First Amendment rights would be violated. And it, interestingly, he relied primarily on cases from the civil rights movement, um, which had done, you know, where similarly where the protesters in the South had been sued for damages. In any event, the Supreme Court upheld the trial court in terms of dismissing the case. Um, and would have thought at that point that the case was over, but it turned out it was not. Um, the city, in addition to damages, had also sought what's called injunctive relief. Now, injunctive relief is basically an order from a court. It's anything outside of damages. It can be an order to do something. It can be an order not to do something. And it's, it's common in private and public litigation. And it's often you hear what's called a preliminary injunction, which is an injunction while a case is still pending to keep things in, in sort of the same situation. But the idea is that an injunction is based upon a finding of a violation of rights, that you're entitled to an injunction if you can prove that your rights are being threatened or your rights have been violated. And in this case, the trial judge said, well, there have been no rights that have been, no rights have been violated, therefore there's no need to consider an injunction. And Supreme Court, much to, I think, everybody's shock, including the city of Keene, said no. Even though the case was properly dismissed, the trial judge still needs to consider whether or not it's appropriate to issue an injunction against the demonstrators. Now, initially, Keene had sought to keep all demonstrators 50 feet away from each parking enforcement officer, which, for a variety of reasons, was basically to exile them from downtown. Um, during the course of the hearings, the 50 feet became 30 feet, the 30 feet became 10 feet, but they were still trying to seek a sort of a area, uh, sort of a, a, an area around each parking enforcement officer. And the, um, so the case went back to the trial court to see whether or not it should issue this some sort of order basically keeping all demonstrators away from parking enforcement officers. And ultimately, the trial court decided, partly because the, the level of demonstrations by this point had receded, that the whatever protection an injunction would officer off, offer to the parking enforcement officers was outweighed by the damage it would do to First Amendment rights. And we went back to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld that. But the concept that even where a demonstration is not is not violating any rule or law or regulation or any individual right, that a municipal body can still seek an injunction to limit the rights of, of demonstrators is, is a very disturbing potential precedent. Now, I don't, so far that hasn't happened to my knowledge, and I'm not sure most people are even aware of this risk. So it may just be one of those, you know, like, like Chaplinsky, one of those bad decisions that ends up going nowhere. Um, but it is an example of the fact that, that so much of this can be double-edged, both on, on the sort of good side and the bad side. And, and on that theme, I just want to make one final sort of um, connection. And that is one of the, the, the key forms of, of sort of demonstration in the Keene case was the use of video cameras and also audio recordings, and there was a huge um, <coughs> volume of that, many of which, well, not many of which, but several of which were shown um, during the course of the various hearings and were subject to different interpretations. Um, and I, I think you are all aware that there have been a couple of cases from the First Circuit, which is the federal court that governs New Hampshire, which has basically upheld the right to, to videotape and audiotape, notwithstanding state laws that may make it, may make it, um, criminal. 
And, and there are just two things I want to say about that. First of all, there was a case that came down about a year ago in Massachusetts called um, Martin v. Gross. And even though it's a, it's a Massachusetts federal district court case, it, it's probably going to be, would be influential in New Hampshire. Now, the mass statute on wiretapping, both New Hampshire and Massachusetts require consent of both sides to, for taping. But the mass statute is, is essentially only applies to secret recordings. And in the, this case, the plaintiffs, which in, included this um, Project Veritas, I don't know if you're familiar, but the Project Veritas is, is a group on the right side of the political spectrum that uses various types of subterfuges to sort of get people to say things on the left side of the spectrum that is embarrassing. Um, and so, so for them, use of sort of hidden taping is sort of, it's, it's the core to what they do. So the argument was, the argument was made in that case was that the mass statute as applied to police officers and other public officials was unconstitutional because there was a fundamental right to record them in public spaces even when the recording was secret. And that was um, vigorously contested by the um, political authorities in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the arguments they made was, well, if the recording is, the question was, why would the state have an interest in protecting and prohibiting secret recordings? And their argument was, particularly the police officers, their argument was, well, if the police officer know he's, knows he's being recorded, he has an opportunity to improve his behavior or her behavior. It seems like a, it seems like it's sort of strange that you need to have a, a recording in order to provide an incentive for police officers to abide by the law. In any event, the, 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 the judge did not have a lot of difficulty in holding the um, in, in saying that secret recordings is a right that a state cannot prohibit recordings. It does cannot require that recordings be made public. Um, but. There are a couple of things I just want to say about this whole area. Because my experience in, in the uh, Robin Hood case was that the two sides, this was after Glick had been decided, had dramatically different interpretations of Glick, and I'm not sure that either interpretation is correct. On, on the side of Keene, somehow Keene saw, in Glick the court says, there is a right, First Amendment right not only to speak, but to get information. And one way to get information is by recording, so it's constitutionally protected. First Amendment. But the court also said that the state, or, or the state police officers in that case, can set reasonable time, place, and manner limitations. So Keene looked at that and said, aha, we can, we can say, all right, we'll allow recording, but you have to record from 100 feet away or 50 feet away or whatever. I mean, they, they saw that as being a license to basically set up whatever restriction they wanted about the logistics of reporting, which, and that, again, was one of the points that the trial judge uh, knocked down. But on the other side of it, um, in, in just talking to a number of the people who participate in this protest, the, the theory from Glick was that basically we can report anybody we want, anywhere, anyhow, etc. And, and it's important to to sort of understand that there is, from the court's point of view, there is a middle ground here. And one of the things that the, was asked the court in Martin, the most recent case, was to try to define that, which the court refused to do. But, but one issue is location. Um, in the world of the First Amendment, there's something called a public forum. And a public forum is like a park, it's a sidewalk, it's downtown Keene, it's places where free expression has been historically allowed. And the question is whether the right to record only applies in those type of places. Now in Glick, the court didn't use the word public forum, which is the technical First Amendment term. The court used the term public space. And the question is how far, if at all, does public space go beyond public forum? And, and to make this a little bit more concrete, um, 
as uh, Dan mentioned, or I think Daryl mentioned, I was involved in a case involving uh, a gentleman whose First Amendment expression involved donning a guerrilla outfit and uh, doing his guerrilla theater up on Mount Manadno. And in that case, um, the question is, is Mount Manadnock a public forum? Is Mount Manadnock a place, you know, in which the, the public is, you know, there's sort of this historical right to, to gauge in free expression? Now, ironically, in that case, the state agreed that it was a public forum. So that really wasn't contested. But after this, two sides had presented their arguments to, to, to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, the court of its own initiative said, we want you to, to tell us the, whether to argue this issue. We want the state to argue that Mount Manadnock's not a public forum. So the state argued that. And then later on, the court said, well, it's too late because basically, you know, you conceded it earlier. But there is a question about whether, for example, parks, I mean, national parks and places are, are public forums. But perhaps more significantly, and I know that some of the, um, uh, some of the same people involved in Robin Hood have, have faced this, how about like the UNH campus? Um, I mean, that is a public, the UNH is owned by the state. Um, on the other hand, most courts have held that state universities, state colleges are not public forums for First Amendment point perspective. So I just want to flag the fact that there is a unresolved issue as to whether there is a right to record in areas outside of what are considered traditional um, public forums. Um, the second issue has to do with who can be recorded. Um, the initial cases, certainly Glick, involved police officers. Uh, but it was clear in Glick, the court didn't just say police officers, it said public officials. But then the question is, who is a public official? Um, and the issue of, um, you know, I had a case involving the Department of Motor Vehicles. The head of the Department of Motor Vehicles is certainly a public official. But when you, when you go up to the um, debt, when you go up to the counter, you speak to a clerk, and that person is employed by the state, but would that person be considered a public official? Do you have the right to record that interaction? I know that certainly happened. I think, again, that's an area where the, the law still has not been, been developed. And then there's also, finally, the, and, and what happens if, what happens if there are other people present? What happens if you're recording a public official, but there are private citizens nearby? Now, in the Glick case, what, that involved recording occurring on the Boston Common, where a, um, a police officer was, was, was doing an arrest, and, and a bystander recorded the arrest. So not only was the police officer record, recorded, but so was the person being arrested. So there's some precedent for saying the fact that somebody else is there doesn't mean you can't record. But then again, the police officers say, well, what if we're talking to a, to a confidential informant? I mean, it gets, again, it gets to a question of, of other people involved. And then finally, the question of, um, in, in, in the Garrity case, which obviously is close at home to people here, um, you know, that was, a, a st that was a nighttime traffic stop. And basically, the police took the position that because of the nature of a nighttime traffic stop, it would never be reasonable to record in that situation. And the First Circuit had, had no problem had no problem shooting that down. But in that case, the recording was taking place, or non-recording was taking place from like 30 feet away. So what if you, what if it was 10 feet away? I mean, how far, again, the situations people come to me on, they're typically told to move back. How far can they be required to move back? Um, at what point does that basically have the effect of making the video recording impossible? Um, even though while essentially, ostensibly allowing it. So I just want to flag the fact that even though the law, the cases have been consistently favorable to the right of recording, mainly because the, um, the facts of these cases and the defenses have been so outrageous, um, that there remains a number of um, you know, still unresolved questions, which, which are great for me as lawyers, <laughs> as a lawyer. And, and also, you know, it, 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 there may be an important interest from the First Amendment point of view to sort of push, push the frontiers on this and create, you know, but still, at least if, if you're going to do that, 
at least be aware of the fact that you are, um, that there is, it's not as clear cut, um, that there is some level of risk involved, and, and just take that risk knowingly. So I don't really want to take it any further. As I know this has been a long day. I think I've probably given you as much law as uh, you can reasonably digest after dinner. Um, but I would be happy to answer any questions, <coughs> concerns. I've yeah. got a question for you. Sure. Uh, you mentioned the Maynard case where the guy had uh, either removed or covered up live free or die on the license plates. And uh, as I understand, and correct me if my understanding of the uh, ruling is incorrect, but as I understand it, the court basically ruled that compelled speech is a violation of First Amendment. Do you think that the Maynard ruling could be used to challenge the validity of public funding of uh, campaigns? Um. I know there's a case in Seattle uh, over something they call democracy <clears throat> dollars. It's a public funding of uh, municipal elections and that's being challenged right now, but I don't know if they're citing Maynard, but they are arguing that it's essentially compelled speech, which is a violation. Well, it, I mean, look, that would, that would be a considerable, I mean, I can certainly understand how that would follow from, from Maynard, but that's not like a little step. I mean, that's like, <laughs> I mean, that, that's like an Olympic long jump. <laughs> Which, 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 which again doesn't mean that, that I mean that's how the law develops, but but my guess is it wouldn't it wouldn't I mean it just seems like there have to be some steps in between to get from one to the other. So the question over yeah. Um, so you talked about how the courts haven't really identified how far away you have to be before you're interfering with law enforcement operations and then law enforcement safety sort of takes over. Uh, have any of the courts looked at the Tweller drill and the 21 feet that police officers often get some experts to testify that within 21 feet a person with a knife can get there faster than you can draw and shoot your gun, um, which is usually used in a wrongful death action as if the person was within seven yards, I can shoot them without knowing whether they got a gun. Ha has there have have the courts actually looked at that and said, well, this is why you can't record inside of those seven yards? Or do they not do they not try and allege that somehow the person with the camera is dangerous? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I guess the only thing I was just, just starting with the premise, I think it's highly unlikely that there's ever going to be any sort of, arbit any, any sort of, you know, whether it's five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet, so it, it's so fact specific. In other words, you're looking at, I would think in a case like this, most the court, you're looking at probably a dozen different considerations. Um, one of which is, is just the distance itself, but there, there are many others. I mean, you'd have to look at how does this affect the ability to, to, to report. I mean, that would be certainly a consideration. Secondly, would be a consideration of does this impact, does this somehow interfere with law enforcement operations? What, what's the rationale? So I would think in some cases, you might have a case where 10 feet was considered within the constitutional right. Another case might say 50 feet. Again, really, really, I, I, I think that, that, that the number of feet is just sort of a, a fairly small part of the overall analysis. There's a question to go there? That was literally the question I was going to ask. No, it would, it would be nice, I think, if, if you could sort of bring a measuring stick with you and sort of know exactly how many feet away, but I, I just don't think that's the way the law is like to Yeah. So, you <clears throat> talked about uh, recording a public forum or public space involving government officials, but what about other private parties? You know, do you have, I know it's, I know it's not the same thing, but we're in this era of mass surveillance, we're always being recorded whether it's security cameras or law enforcement putting cameras up. So do you have, I don't know, and plus this right to privacy, like how does this intersect like maybe with either private actors or like, do I have a right not to be recorded? Do I have a right, you know, not to be surveilled? Um, so on the flip side of it, you know, you mentioned people who are like 
Oh, but the cop was arresting me, but I objected to being recorded, even though I made a benefit to me. You know, on the other side of it. Well, I mean, I mean, that, I mean, the thing is, that question is so good that I, it's beyond my ability to answer it. Basically, I mean, I mean, because I mean, you, you, you're raising really. I mean, there are that is the question. I mean, there are questions. I mean, one question is. I mean, you see now, in in so many of these these, um, I think most recently the horrendous homicide um, in Connecticut, where so much of it's based upon all these different cameras of different, you know, and, and cameras. I mean, it's we're not quite at the point of Great Britain, but there are cameras almost everywhere. So how does that impact things? I think it, in some ways it becomes harder to complain about an invasion of privacy from a video camera when we're all of us being filmed in so many other locations. And then, but then the question is, at some point, do you just let go of the right of privacy altogether? And how does that, I mean, how does the, you know, I mean, one of the arguments I made in, 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 in um, Robin Hood is that police officers and public officials are not like other, they're not like private individuals. I mean, you sort of give up. I mean, pardon, yeah. and, and in fact, in fact, in the Glick case, there's a discussion about that, that one of the things that you, by becoming a police officer, you make certain, you give up certain things, and you have to accept certain burdens that, that private citizens don't necessarily have to, to accept. But, but again, in the real world, I mean, you don't just, people are, you know, they're in crowds, they're with other people. I mean, it becomes really hard to say. And then, of course, the officers themselves have cameras. So, I mean, you know, there's so many different aspects of this that make it much more, make it. So the principle, which thanks to a number of pioneers, is now clear, a First Amendment right to gather information, that right is secure, I think. But how it actually gets defined and how it affects everybody's right to privacy, I think is still an evolution. Any other? Yeah. Yes. Um, did the cops really argue that they have a right to not have an interaction with a confidential informant in a public space recorded? Like they argued that they were going to be meeting CIs in public. Well, <laughs> like really, they said that. Wait, wait, wait. How loud? <laughs> first, first of all, yes, that was the argument. <laughs> and and um, I mean, it, it, it was, it's been made, I think, in a, in a couple of cases. And, and I mean, look again. It, it, I mean, obviously, normally you wouldn't meet with a confidential informant in, in public. But but again, in, in this day and age, I mean, you know, can you can you say that you there would never be a circumstance where you'd want to do that? I'm not I'm not sure you can rule that. But that but how do they get a halo that the rest of us don't get? Because there's yeah. very clear. You're out in public. You're subject to surveillance, First Amendment law that applies to all of us. Like they get a magic halo because they're meeting the CI. Well, cone of shame. Well, but the, <laughs> I mean, but the, but, the, but the broader, I mean, the broader. I, well, I, I think the question is even as a practical matter. Right? I mean, how does? I mean, if, if if you're an officer going out to meet a confidential informant in public for whatever reason, even though maybe theoretically you have a right to have that encounter private in public. But how do you enforce that? I mean, do, you, do you go tell the reporters, hey, I'm meeting somebody confidential, you can't? I, mean, I, 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 I think it was, it's more, again, sort of like, like so many arguments, it's an argument made for the purpose of, of legal argument, but doesn't really have much reality to it. I, I don't think, that, I, and again, the, the courts are pretty clear that there's really no strong argument against permitting recording in the abstract. It all really comes down to just sort of individual situations. And, and I think, again, what, what Mr. Glick did and what, what Ms. Garrigy did, I mean, they really helped develop a law which I think is now pretty firm. Well, to, to follow up on that, the more interesting question, I think, is what can we do to push the law in the right direction rather, and, you know, the corollary, I guess, is what should we not do that's not going to help push the law in the right direction? <laughs> Well, I mean, look, for, from my perspective, as, as a civil rights lawyer, it's a pretty depressing judicial terrain. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I look at the, the, sort of the members of the Supreme Court in Washington and in Concord, and, and it's pretty discouraging. Um, but, but I don't, you know, I mean, I, 
I, I guess my thought is that, is that, that with rare exceptions, when you engage in First Amendment activity and political activity, you don't do it, I think, to create new law. There are, there are rare test case situations. I think the better thing is to, is to focus on, on, on the politics of it. And if, if there's a, I mean, what, 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 what is the way to most effectively express your message? I mean, that, that to me is the issue. And if that raises legal questions, then, you know, consult with the First Amendment lawyer. Uh, but I, I don't think otherwise that it's, I mean, you know, it, it's so hard to predict here I mean, you want to be outrageous, but you don't want to be too outrageous. You know, exactly where that dividing line is is really hard to identify. Yeah. What do you want to look for in a client that brings up a case that looks interesting, but you know, if you take it, the client may blow things up on you, and you say, "No, I don't. I don't think I should touch this one," as opposed to. Yes, this is a worthy case, and I think I'm going to go with it. Well, you know, most most of the work I do is as an employment lawyer, and I'm representing employees. Um, and in, in that situation, it's, it's very, you know, who my client is and what they do and don't do is very important. I, I don't feel that way in the First Amendment. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the First Amendment, you know, I'm happy to represent somebody who's who's completely outrageous in every possible way. Um, you know, I, I personally prefer to represent people whose political beliefs <laughs> I do not share, because that makes it clear that what we're talking about is the principle and not the, the political ideology. So I, I, I'd be hard pressed to, to think of, um, I mean, look at Walter Chaplinsky, or, or look at George Maynard. Look, look at these guys who have set, you know, the most important sort of legal principles and precedents. I mean, these were very, very difficult individuals who were generally very principled, but often with pretty bizarre principles. Um, you know, often very sort of. I mean, in the Robin Hood, you had a good a group working together, but most cases are are people who are very. Very, very, um, you know, often very, very difficult. Um, you know, there's just another case recently on the First Amendment in New Hampshire. There was this guy, um, I think in Epping, <coughs> Epping? I'm not oh. sure, who yeah. was who was um, he was sued for criminally defaming. I mean, he was he was exited. Yeah, exited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. criminally defaming a um, <laughs> police chief. And, and you're looking at what he said and looking at his history. I mean, this isn't exactly, you know, Mr. You know, John Public Citizen. Um, but but that he's been setting a really important precedent. And and the fact that he may have been outrageous, you know, is certainly not a reason not to represent him. And I don't think it hurt the case. So, however, I mean. Don't, don't feel you have to be respectable to give me a call. <laughs> I got one. Sure. I, I can monopolize your time for the next three hours, so I'll try not to do that. Um, uh, back in 2015, um, I was attacked by Donald Trump doing the non uh, Donald Trump rally, uh, thrown over a table, roughed up. So I've been suing them in uh, New Hampshire District Court, District of New Hampshire, uh, since uh, uh, late uh, October of last year. Um, so now the judge has just given an order. She threw out a bunch of the claims. Uh, I've been doing this pro se. Um, but, so a number of the claims were thrown out, um, but the ones that have gone forward is on the actual security card. A bunch of the claims were thrown out specifically because, and I think the court clerks write this bullshit and it's under um, Landrum Cafferty is, is the judge for it. Um, but I think they, they basically just kind of decided like which things they wanted to go forward and they threw out a ton of stuff saying that my appendices uh, were filed wrong um, and that emails and videos were attached improperly. So what my question would be, um, when you're in the initial phases of uh, doing civil case, what what is what is the proper way to attach your emails and videos? <laughs> well, I think, I think more, let, me, let me just say that that uh, I had I had a client. This is in response to your question, but I, I had a client um, some years ago named Steve Comley, um, who like you, 
uh, when uninvited into some, I don't remember, I don't remember who, what was who handed it. He was, well, he was not invited. <laughs> he was quite outspoken and he was um, roughed up and, and that ended up in, in litigation. But then, then a year or two later, uh, the governor's inaugural, um, where we, the governor's getting sworn in by the Supreme the Court and everybody else, Mr. Comley sort of goes and rushes the stage and starts wanting to give, I mean, he was a, uh, a, a sort of anti-nuclear um, zealot, and he got arrested for disturbing the peace. So then I was representing him against the, the criminal charges. And while we were in district court, he had an airplane uh, flying over <laughs> the courthouse saying, free Steve Comley. Nice. It didn't, it, I'll use that. Un unfortunately, unfortunately didn't, <laughs> didn't affect the uh, trial judge. <laughs> and then we ended up in the Supreme Court, and of course, all the judges were witnesses to what Mr. Conley had done. I mean, they were all there on the stage as he was charging. Um, so I argued, <laughs> I, ar I argued that um, they should recuse themselves. They came yes. up with something called the Doctrine of Necessity, which <coughs> somehow held that when nobody could nobody could hear, everybody could, whatever. So they, they ultimately convicted him. Um, so you have good good company. You didn't answer my question. No, I will talk to you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is outside of your uh, specialty knowledge regarding free speech, uh, but in the coming months, our volunteers are going to be collecting candidate petitions. Uh, most of the time in public spaces and public forums. And I know that the college campuses in New Hampshire often get failing grades from uh, the free speech groups that uh, fire the free speech on college campuses. Uh, so do you have any uh, suggestions on how someone should respond to police or some other authority if they're petitioning in a public place and told that they can't do that? Well, with, with caution. I mean, it just, again, I mean, it depends how much of a martyr you want to put yourself into. Because, I mean, this issue came up, in, I mean, people, people um, involving King State. And I personally thought, never having faced it before, that it was a slam dunk, that they, they couldn't, like, King State was barring my client from being on campus because he'd been passing out or something. I thought that was... Yeah, I was one of those individuals right. that right. was so, so banned that, so, so for that, life from Keene State, right. but so, that got rescinded after three months, but I wasn't notified for six. Short, 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 short life. But, too, but, but, so. the, but, the, but the thing that's really pretty shocking is, is that the overwhelming body of... I don't think it's ever gone to the U.S. Supreme Court, but the overwhelming body of the law is that university campuses Public university campuses are not public forums for the, for free speech. So basically, what that means is is that is that if your one of your canvassers is told to to stop, they're probably going to have to stop or get or get arrested. Now, the, one way to get around that is this idea of discrimination. In other words, although they they probably can bar all petitioners. They have to be consistent. So, if you have, for example, I was I was on Keene State campus um, several months ago at a, at a uh, Cory Booker rally, and there were certainly people there handing stuff out. So you can say, well, how come? You know, I mean, discrimination based upon content is sort of the ultimate evil from a First Amendment point of view. So I think the best response there is to do some research about other groups and then say you can't treat them differently. <laughs> It, it, if I may, just as a sure. follow-up to that, I know in the uh, uh, Bruneyard Shopping Center case uh, versus Alabama, they argued that the more uh, uh, public things, like a police officer thing or an army recruitment center there, uh, makes a public space, it might be privately owned, uh, but for intents and purposes of the First Amendment, um, is public. Yeah, now most of those shopping center cases have been lost. I mean, so what, what's been happening is, but, the but, 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 but what's been happening is that is that advocates are going under state law because federal law is not good. But but generally with all those sort of things, if you can, I, th I really think the discrimination angle is the best bet. Yeah. So on a university campus, what if it's a student 
collecting signatures or distributing a flyer versus a not someone someone from off campus coming? Would that be either one of those better clients, or would it be clearer a case that you know how can a university discriminate against one of its own students exercising the First Amendment? Well, if 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 it, if if the university state university campus is not a public forum. That doesn't necessarily mean that all speech can be eliminated, but it does give the university much greater authority to regulate than, for example, in a park or a sidewalk. No, I understand that. So, I, so from my perspective, if it's a student as opposed to somebody from outside the university, that is, I'm not sure it's a game changer, but it's certainly an important and helpful fact, depending on the circumstance. But yes, I think that would be, make a stronger, stronger case. What if the student was the candidate? <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that would that would matter. Well, I mean, again, that I, I think it matters a little bit. I think the fact that it's a student is the more important fact, and, and I think that's a helpful fact. Well, I appreciate everybody's questions and patience, and thank you for inviting me. It's definitely been a privilege to speak to you. Uh, Dan Fishman, let me have you come back up here for a minute, please. I didn't do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, didn't do it. <laughs> Justin O'Donnell, Am I being a please come team? to the front of the room. <laughs> Dan has something to tell you. <laughs> I do, and actually I'm going to take it a step further. 